All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. I think some people are still being admitted from the waiting room, um, but I will start us off with some housekeeping and some welcomes. So we're really excited that everybody's joining us this morning. Um, we did our first ever virtual garden tour last week featuring some home gardens around the state of Maryland. And today we are focusing on community gardens. So some uh, really interesting um, stories and collaborations and uh, we're excited to share them with you. So my name is Erin Reed Miller. I am the education manager at Patterson Park Audubon Center in Baltimore. And I'm here with a, uh, a small group of gardeners uh, who I will introduce later, um, but we're so thankful that, that they are here sharing their spaces with us. And then I'm also here with my colleagues, uh, Susie Creamer, who is the director of the Audubon Center, and Patty Smith, thanks for being our, our backup tech person this morning, uh, so that hopefully we can have a, a seamless tour. So uh, just to cover some housekeeping items, um, you uh, hopefully noticed that when you entered the webinar that you um, have automatically been muted. And uh, we're just gonna ask everyone to keep yourselves on mute so that we can prevent any background noise or interference. Um, we are gonna utilize the chat for all of our Q&A today. So we'll show you the videos of each gardener's um, space, and during that video, you can feel free to enter your questions into the chat. Uh, the gardens will be kind of identified by the person's name who is sharing it with us. So hopefully you can uh, notice and jot down that person's name and direct your question to a specific person just to kind of help uh, the, the question answering be a little more efficient. And then um, while you're in the chat, make sure that little drop down setting um, uh, is selected to send your question to everybody um, as opposed to a single person so that hopefully you know all of us can benefit from um, the question and the answers. And then I did want to let everybody know that the webinar is being recorded today. Um, there really is no reason since all of our Q&A is happening through the chat um, that anyone would need their video turned on besides um, our panelists. So if you wanted to save your bandwidth, you can turn off your video. Um, but if you still would uh, prefer not to be a part of a recorded webinar, then now would be the time to exit. And then um, after the presentation today, we will send a link to the recording to all of our registrants. Um, so you won't miss out on anything except maybe your own personal questions being answered. Um, and so we'll send that link to everybody and then um, we are going to put uh, the recordings of both garden tours up on our YouTube page. So you can always uh, check out the recordings there as well. We're also going to send you a link to take a brief survey. I actually sent it to you along with your confirmation email. Um, since this is our first time doing these virtual garden tours, we're, we're really trying to learn and make this experience as great as possible. Um, you know, even in the future, if we're able to resume, not if, hopefully when we're able to resume in-person garden tours, um, there's, you know, no reason why we couldn't uh, include a virtual option. And so we're trying to learn from all of you. And so we would really appreciate if you took a few minutes following um, this morning's tour to uh, take that survey. It's, it's less than 10 questions. I think SurveyMonkey estimated it'll take you about four minutes. So um, we appreciate that. And then we would also like to invite you to check out our website, which is patterson.audubon.org, um, especially our Bird Friendly Communities page there. You can find lots of downloadable resources, including our top 10 lists of the most birdorific uh, plant uh, genera and garden templates and uh, a link to National Audubon Society's Plants for Birds uh, database. Um, so all kinds of fun things to check out there. And it's also where you can find a link to apply for your own Audubon bird friendly habitat uh, garden sign. So um, Susie's also going to uh, mention a little bit later how you can help to support us. We would really appreciate that. And then of course, uh, you know, word of mouth and telling your neighbors, it's kind of what the, the habitat recognition program is all about. You put up the sign and then um, serve as an ambassador to all of your, your friends and neighbors. So um, with that, hopefully everybody has caught up with us. And I would love to start by telling you 
um, a little bit about what it means to be a bird-friendly habitat. And we thought the best way to start that was showing you a quick three-minute video of a bird's eye view. All right, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an overview, pun intended, of why these spaces that we restore um, are so important for uh, migratory birds. If you look at this map, um, it's pretty easy to see that um, the places where we work, where we live, um, where we go to school, where we play and interact in our communities, um, you know, they're important to us and um, our neighbors and our friends, but they're also really important places to the billions of birds, literally billions of birds, that pass through Maryland along the Atlantic Flyway every single year as they're migrating. And so as we're thinking about these birds and the entire um, year's uh, life cycle for them, um, you know, they're, they're traveling hundreds, if not thousands of miles they um, are looking for places where they can stop and rest and refuel along these migratory journeys and so finding that habitat in our urban and suburban areas um, are, are really critical um, especially if you consider that the the lights in these places tend to lure birds in as they're migrating at night um, they are going to be looking for life-saving uh, gardens um, below them in our, our cities and suburbs. 
And so that is why Audubon in the state of Maryland has recognized folks who have uh, transformed their homes. Um, and then today we're talking about community spaces. So businesses and schools and congregations um, transformed those places into spots that are beneficial for birds um, and include all the things that birds need um, in their habitat and while they're migrating um, and reducing threats to birds. So um, those are some of the criteria for getting recognized by Audubon for um, having bird-friendly habitat. And uh, as you can see on this map that uh, across the state of Maryland, we're really proud of over 200 folks who, who have done this. And um, you know, this isn't a, an entirely selfless effort, right? These spaces are meant to be beautiful. They're meant to um, encourage community. And those are the kinds of things and the kinds of stories that we're going to, to hear from our panelists today. Um, so we know that these gardens are absolutely vital for birds, uh, but they accomplish lots of other uh, things for, for us personally as well. So um, I wanted to encourage you, hopefully after today you feel really inspired to go to our website and uh, you can see under the conservation tab there is a link for um, information about bird friendly communities. That's where you can find all of those downloadable materials that I talked about. And there's also a link to a habitat yard sign. And I just, I wanted to say that you, you don't need a yard. It's really kind of a misnomer. You don't need a yard to have habitat. Gardens come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, and we will see some of that today. So that's, what, that's the link where you can find um, a downloadable application. So you can have the criteria at hand while you are designing and planning your, your garden spaces. Um, there's also an online form um, which when you are ready to um, actually apply to get your Audubon sign, I would personally highly encourage you to fill out the online form because it actually uh, saves a step for me um, since I'm the person running uh, this program for the state of Maryland and DC. Um, if you put in your information in that online form, you will automatically show up on our map. So your little orange icon will appear um, like you saw in the previous slide, and that really allows us to visualize that amazing patchwork quilt of bird-friendly habitat across the state of Maryland. So that's where you can find that information. Um, hopefully you'll feel inspired to head that way after today, and uh, you can always, you know, send us questions, attend one of our free wildlife gardening workshops. We'll be doing more of those in the spring. Um, and yeah, I mean, make uh, Maryland birdland like we know that it should be. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, now and uh, I'll just kind of give you a little preview of how the tour will work. So um, what our five gardeners did is they actually took video of their own spaces and sent it to us. Um, and I really appreciate all of their persistence with technology and everything that that took. Um, and that allowed me to combine each of their five gardens into one video. And so I was able to kind of moderate the video. Uh, you'll be able to watch the, the video without having to adjust your volume too much um, between each of the gardens. Um, so like I mentioned, each of the gardeners will be identified by their location and their name um, before you see their space. And so, you know, take a mental note or even jot down um, that person's name so that if you have a question, you can enter it into the chat and hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions. So that video will run about 20 minutes. And then um, following that, I have some questions to kind of kick us off, um, but please feel free to enter your questions at any time and um, we'll try to wrap up by 11 o'clock. So. And fine, just bear with me one second. Here we go. All right. The 
rain gardens planted spring of 2015 were cited according to the Butchers Hill 2009 Master Plan and Feasibility Report for greening and stormwater control projects within our community. The robust construction by the City of Baltimore allows for both traffic calming and pedestrian crossings at the three gardens. Busy vehicular and pedestrian traffic unfortunately means little bird activity, but the birds love the surrounding mature tree canopy. Not all neighbors were enthusiastic about the gardens. After the plants were spreading nicely, a resident not recognizing any of the native plants, we'd whack them all. Feedback was that the garden curbs would cause accidents, they were ugly eyesores, and the plants were weeds. Well, the garden design, which has been very successful, was by Blue Water Baltimore, selecting eight plants that are native and duplicated in all three gardens. They provide color and con as texture contrast early spring to late fall. This shows the plants growing nicely and that sign advises bilingually no dog poop. The need for education on the function and benefits of the rain gardens was acknowledged from the get-go and confirmed by the weed whacking event. Two residents undertook the design, fabrication, and installation of the needed educational signs with an unveiling event November of 2017. The gardens are now a source of community pride and enjoyment, enhanced by earning Audubon's bird-friendly status. You can see it gives a clear description of the function and pictures of all the eight plants. And those plants, in order of bloom, begin with golden ground cell in the early spring that has these beautiful yellow flowers atop 12 to 15 inch stems. Next is the delicate irises. Also, they prefer wet areas like the golden ground cell. In the foreground, that's little blue stem, one of the two grasses. And black-eyed Susans are very nice in all the gardens. That's golden ground cell again, but no flowers because that's blooming time has passed. That's Joe Pieweed. And there are also a number of uh, New York asters there that are not in bloom yet, but they will be shortly. And that's the sea oats, the second grass. Cone flowers that have gone to seed, most of them, and a few have not. More of the asters and the black-eyed Susans. And fall is heralded by the beautiful periwinkle blue New York asters. And they are loved by the pollinators and they take the gardens out in a blaze of color with pollinators galore. Welcome to Loyola University, Maryland's Conservation and Experiential Learning Garden. This 15,000 square foot restored meadow wildlife habitat features over a dozen varieties of native perennial grasses, trees, and flowering plants that bloom throughout the spring, summer, and fall seasons. The Conservation Garden was funded by BGE Green Grants, designed in collaboration with Loyola's biology department, and installed by over 100 student volunteers in October 2018. This wildlife habitat is certified by Audubon of Patterson Park, National Wildlife Federation, and Monarch Watch. This restored meadow garden space is a part of Loyola's larger project to reimagine the Evergreen Campus, to protect and enhance native biodiversity, and inspire environmental stewardship. We're working to achieve these goals by establishing a corridor of native wildlife habitat across our 89-acre Evergreen Campus in Northern Baltimore City. Since 2016, we have converted over five acres of conventional turf lawn into low-mow landscapes and wildlife habitat. With an existing tree canopy and source of water available right next door, we focused on reducing the flow of storm water and inviting pollinators and other insects back into the landscape. That's to provide high quality food for our feathered friends. 
As you can see, this garden receives lots of sun, but there's also a few mature trees that create some areas of shade. This footage was recorded in May during the first year, so only Coreopsis is in bloom. Those are the pops of yellow that you see in the footage here. However, since then, large drifts of oxide daisy, golden alexander, bee balm, black-eyed susan, goldenrod, and New England Aster can be seen blooming throughout the seasons. Thank you for visiting our garden. We hope to see you soon. Hi, I'm Gary Gillespie, and I'm a member and green team leader at Homewood Friends Meeting Quakers. We're located on Charles Street, right across from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, this project, this garden project, began a couple years ago when we sort of envisioned working with One Water Partnership uh, to take lawn, these were two strips of grass that had been grass since the early 20s when the meeting house was built, and turn it into a native garden. We went through a process with Blue Water Baltimore uh, and Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake and um, Blue Water Baltimore and Interfaith Power and Light to apply for a grant through the Chesapeake Bay Trust, which we received, and we added a match in order to develop our, our cisterns, which were built at uh, Blue Water Baltimore and installed by Blue Water Baltimore. Um, we also went through uh, working on a design that Blue Water Baltimore developed and uh, the garden started with uh, a planning in the early spring with volunteers from uh, One Water Partnership, including other congregations, helping plant this garden. Along the side here, I'll walk through different um, plants. On the side wall here, uh, the Orchard Project, whose office was located in our building, uh, uh, planted these apple trees. And uh, they're attached to the wall and uh, been thriving for several years now. Along the garden, uh, we have uh, asters that, that are in bloom. Left here we have one type of golden rod that's in bloom. Behind the golden rod are switch grasses. And down on this side we have uh, a bush called beauty berry that was really covered with berries uh, probably a week or two ago. So they have become bird food. And again, switch grasses. Black-eyed Susans. A moss phlox. Member of the congregation planted sage here. For their personal use, they live in the apartment. Mm -hmm. so. And then black eyed Susans, arrowwood, this is a shrub behind the black eyed Susans, or switch grass. There's different uh, butterfly weed. Right here we have echinacea, which was in bloom this summer, and uh, again, food for birds into, into, through the fall and into the winter. Down here is a, a, a phlox that uh, blooms in the summertime. And 
we have a moss flux right right behind. And these are our winter greens right in front of uh, our second cistern. Uh, we're looking at berry poppins. And then beside berry poppins is Mr. Poppins. <laughs> flocks. Another another butterfly weed. And in the front garden, in front of the meeting house, is a heath aster, which uh, just came in the bloom. And uh, it's slowly creeping across our walkway, so I have to think about that. And then behind uh, is black chokeberry that a couple of weeks ago was also covered in uh, the berries. It's the berries left. Uh, and to the left, there's another type of uh, golden rock that the other day was covered with these. That effect. There's one right there. <laughs> and, and then uh, Northern Bayberry. Hey everyone, welcome to Charm City Needworks Audubon Certified Garden. At Charm City Needworks, there were some issues with water and erosion, so they have used many native plants to help solve some of these problems. Here we have some switchgrass that is great for birds as well. On the other side, there's more switchgrass. We have some black-eyed Susans that have gone to seed, which are also great for the migrating birds. Over here is a great shrub for stormwater uses and stabilizing slopes. It's called Sweet Spire or Itea virginica. Moving on, we have some cone flowers. We have a little service berry in the back, right here. Some native hibiscus. This shrub in the front is summer sweet or plethora. More switchgrass and some beautiful trees, a red bud and a birch. Over here, we have some goldenrod, the yellow flower. We have more of the sweet spire with the red leaves. And more clethra. Along our sidewalk, we have a little pollinator pocket garden. In the back, you'll see the taller switch grasses. Along the front here are some asters that have yet to bloom, so they'll have some nice late season nectar for our pollinating friends. And a little goldenrod on the end. Hi, I'm Michael Martin. I'm pastor here of Steel Metal Community Fellowship in Southwest Baltimore. And uh, I understand that we're part of a, of a uh, garden tour, as it were. And so you can see around me some of what we've been doing just lately. And I probably should tell you that what you'll see immediately is connected to the 10 acres of forest that has over the last two years become Steel Metal 
Peace Park. And us having flowers around is probably completely connected to the fact that we realized that we had an external stewardship um, that connects to the internal stewardship that we feel as a Christian congregation. And we realized, oh my goodness, it matters what we do externally. It, it should be beautiful. It should be inviting to people. It should be meditative, etc. It should be a contribution to the community. Um, and it should make God smile, maybe, right? And so, here, you know, here now we have ground bees, uh, bumblebees, um, and just regular honeybees. In fact, we have, I think we'll get an opportunity to just show you real quickly our apiary, where we have three, um, uh, uh, you know, honeybee hives, as it were. And so here we have um, uh, uh, a, the start of some things that have happened over the last uh, just a little while. May I say the names of the plants? Yes, please. All right, so in the background looks like Liatra spicata, which is blazing star. The blooming flower, these asters are wonderful. Looks like New England aster, probably. This is uh, moving from there. That's Zizia aurea, which is golden alexander. We've got some Amsonia here. These are wonderful. Got some Echinacea purpurea. That's the purple comb flower in bloom. Uh, next to that, we've got some nice ground cover here. This is uh, Phlox subulata, which is the, um, sorry, not the creeping crops, the moss phlox. And a lot of this is related to our partnership with National Wildlife Federation. Uh, and they have been very um, integral in helping us and educating us, really. And what's exciting about it, it's not just educating our church, but it is helping us as a community. We are becoming kind of a, a garden, a tree, a flower source of education, not only for some of our uh, community members, as I said, but even our children and youth. We are extremely excited about this in regards to all of that. So we, we have... Uh, a great uh, collection here yeah, and then uh, down near our marquee is where um, again all of this is recent from the work with National Wildlife Federation and you also have partnerships with Blue Water Baltimore Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake that's and with exactly Audubon right. we did some things together with earlier Audubon, this year. that's right and with the um, Forest Service um, the National Forest Service is one of our key partners as well. Um, we're starting to work with Morgan State and Coppin State in terms of our park and the, the creek that we have, the pond, the wildlife that's there, all of that, and trying to educate, do research, et cetera, and, and just help people understand and help us understand how to, how to have cleaner water, how to have uh, fresher air, how to deal with things that cause asthma, et cetera. And so that's one of the things that's cool about the bees, frankly. Um, and I have been well, much more educated as a result of all of this. I know stuff that I just wasn't interested in before. Uh, would you mind speaking to your vision for the parking lot and depaving and what it might look like in the future? Yeah, there's, there's two things that we're trying to um, figure out right now. One is we already have a program that's actually funded and everything to put an island in the middle of this. Um, if you look here, um, rainwater, we're in a flood zone and so there's a big, big thing that you won't have time to hear about, but water just crushes down. Um, so we're being advised to put an interruption here. There's probably a technical word for that, but um, a tree island. And so that'll go in right in the middle. And then we're just trying to figure out what we must or might do with this huge amount of asphalt. Wanted you to have a real image and, and to validate that I wasn't blowing smoke when I said we had a, a number of beehives. And as you can see, we do. It's been here about two, two and a half years. They are producing honey. Um, um, up till now, up to just recently, the uh, gentleman who's been working with us has been uh, harvesting the honey. And we are this far away from you being able to purchase uh, still metal raw honey right and uh, some of that will go toward us helping you know kids with college and that kind of stuff but it also means that some of our youth have increasingly become involved they are trained and being trained in how to uh, work with bees they got the suits and everything 
and this relates to all of that uh, pollinization uh, and all of that uh, nectar etc that's being produced um, not only what you saw but in our forest as well so Thank you so, so much, everyone. Uh, I want to thank all the gardeners, first of all, for your participation in this session, but also your leadership and, and really doing the work, digging in the dirt and, and getting it done. Um, also, I wanted to uh, thank Erin, who curated this whole thing, put together quite the selection of videos into a beautiful collage and ordering it with music and all those, those uh, technological details that are essential. So thank you for preparing the presentation for us. Um, I'm Susie Creamer, Center Director of Patterson Park Audubon Center, and I wanted to say just a few words as I remind you to add additional questions into the chat now. And Erin has a few to get us started, I think she mentioned, but we'll take any unanswered questions for the panelists, preferably if you can, as we said, name the person your question is directed to, or maybe it's, it's for multiple folks, that's okay too. Um, so I just wanted to say a few quick words to thank you again for joining us for this presentation. We are glad to have us all together to celebrate this community conservation. It truly is a collaborative effort with gardens of different shapes and sizes to sustain our birds in Baltimore and beyond, in this case in Baltimore, but, but all of these spaces um, are needed by our birds. <clears throat> so I will, um, during the chat as we continue, I'll post a link to Patterson Park Audubon Center's website where you can find more information on gardening for birds. Erin mentioned the how to get your, your garden recognized with a sign, so that's part of it but there are also um, a number of other resources that will be helpful. Um, so in partnership with you, Audubon is here for the birds, right? So we ask that if you're able to do so, please make a donation to Patterson Park Audubon Center. You may know that we are part of National Audubon Society, which is awesome in many ways, but we do have to raise all of our funds locally. So we appreciate donors like you, uh, individuals, gardeners, who support us and allow us to keep our commitment to offering free programming like this. And it's been, it's, been interesting during the chaos of COVID, among other challenges. Some of our foundation funders have reduced their grant making. Uh, we aren't able to bring in the revenue we normally do for school field trips. Um, so we do need your gift to offset the costs um, to keep our, our staff employed and to do these wonderful programs. So uh, things like this, uh, garden tours, wildlife gardening workshops. Erin um, manages, as she said, the Audubon Recognition Program for Gardens in Maryland and DC, and also curating this awesome video today. So if you found this valuable and you value Audubon's other initiatives, um, please make a donation to Patterson Park Audubon Center. And we'll include that link in the follow-up email and I can also post it in the chat. So thank you, thank you. All right, let me hand it back over to Erin who is going to get us started with some questions for our panelists. And uh, we'll take a look at what's in the chat as well. All right, so thanks, Susie. So as she's um, kind of transferring the video back over to me, um, I'm sure we're all Zoom experts at this point, but something that I find handy if you uh, wanted to change your view um, to speaker view as opposed to gallery view, um, and that button should be up in the top right of your screen. Uh, if you're on gallery view, you probably see lots of little uh, squares of mostly people not, you know, sharing their video, which is fine and great. Um, if you change that to speaker view, then you'll be able to, to see the, the person who's speaking um, on the, you know, most of your screen. So um, there was already some excitement and questions going into the chat. I'm going to keep that open on the side of my screen and Susie is as well and our panelists as well so that we can uh, see those and try to answer them. Um, and so, like I said, if, if any questions come in and uh, we don't know the answers, you can always email us at baltimore at audubon.org and we'll make sure your question gets to the right person. Um, so I wanted to uh, just really briefly uh, introduce some of our, um, our panelists. Um, like Susie said, these, you know, are not just folks who are gardening at home, although many of them are. Um, but they're also leaders in, in their communities. 
Um, and as uh, Pastor Michael mentioned so perfectly, they are becoming a resource uh, for, for folks to, to learn about environmental stewardship among all the other things that they do. So um, in order, as you saw them, oh, I'll try to go in order uh, in the video. Um, so Betsy is here from the Butchers Hill neighborhood in Baltimore. Um, Taylor is here from Loyola University in Maryland um, in Baltimore. Gary is here from uh, Homewood Friends. And um, oh no, I skipped Miriam. Miriam is here from Charm City Needworks. And uh, Pastor Michael is here from um, Still Meadow. Did I get that right? Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, please do uh, keep putting your questions into the chat. We have um, a little under 20 minutes left. Um, and I uh, just thought that I would kind of get us rolling with some questions. So Miriam, I'm, I'm actually going to start with you. And uh, Susie's going to get you um, spotlit there. Um, I, I was hoping you could tell us a little more about what your space looked like before and um, how, because I know you all did kind of a major sort of excavation project in addition to the native plants, all the, there was kind of like a rain trench um, in front of your building. Um, so tell us what it looked like before and kind of how it's changed. And then I'm really curious how the customers who come to Charm City Needworks interact with this and how you find that the garden has become kind of a, a benefit to, to your business. Sure, yeah, that's a lot. So, um... The, so the building is actually, and it's very old, it was um, used by the post office first when it was built to store vehicles. Um, and it was, they rerouted the Jones Falls to build this building. So it's just like slowly sinking into the earth. <laughs> um, so um, the front of the building was a mess. Like it was not very well curated. It wasn't really taken care of. Um, so luckily the owner of the company, James, his sister helped us kind of design the full layout. And then with an incredible amount of support from um, Herring Run Nursery and Mary um, in particular, you hear her voice in the video, actually, that was not me being a total plant genius. That was Mary from um, Herring Run um, helped design and pick out plants to not only facilitate um, care for pollinators, uh, um, so, bees and butterflies and birds and all that good stuff, but also help with some of the damage being done because of how water was um, flowing down directly under the building. Um, so it's been a huge help. Overall, the owner of the company has like a multi-tiered plan to continue to expand the garden, improve it, um, add more to um, help protect from rainwater runoff, and just continue to add more um, native plants to um, help our bee population because for those who don't know in the um, event mead is made with honey so we are very protective of the bee population um, and then in regards to community engagement it's interesting we like people really love it but we don't generally get a lot of questions about it <laughs> um, so right now we're still closed to the public our garden is we're keeping it exclusively to neighborhood use and staff use for the charm city mead works um, and people love it. I mean, people walk their dogs there. Um, there have been socially distant baby showers and birthday parties, and there's going to be a, um, a neighbor setting up a Halloween event for kids in the neighborhood um, next weekend. So having that green space, I think, is a really important thing for the neighbors, um, and it really helps facilitate having a place, especially now when people feel kind of trapped inside, neighbors from, um, you know, Johnston Square and Mount Vernon will come and just sit in our garden and hang out. So um, it's been an invaluable resource for us and for the bees, um, but then also for the neighbors in an area where there just isn't that much green space in the city. Awesome. Yeah. And I, gosh, I mean, of course, everybody always appreciated green spaces, but especially now. Um, yeah to have places where you can meet outside. Um, one of the things we were planning to do um, in June with Charm City Mead Works and with Herring Run Nursery was have like a container gardening workshop outside in that space. So um, yeah, it's really, and I'm sure all of these folks have thought about how uh, their gardens can be, you know, more than just a garden. They can be a, a community meeting space. So um, 
yeah, it's awesome to hear how your customers and neighbors are appreciating it. Um, so awesome. Betsy, I wanted to turn to you next and um, you told us about some of the challenges right off the bat with your, um, I know your rain gardens. I am, yeah, I'm not gonna call them bump outs, the rain garden yeah. in Butcher's yeah. Hill and um, kind of how they were perceived at first. And so I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more and kind of give folks an idea about um, kind of the community interaction and the education that happens there and then how you're able to uh, incorporate neighbors in the upkeep of the gardens. Uh oh, did Betsy freeze on us or am I frozen? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'll do the um, first part last. Uh, the, uh, the upkeep is by trained volunteers, and these are people who are interested in helping with the maintenance. Um, because they're selective native plants, as uh, you may remember, there's only eight um, plants in each garden, and each, there are three gardens, and each has all the same plants, though some of them do better in one garden than in another. Um, actually, one of the gardens has no Joe Pye weed, even though we've tried to introduce it, but it doesn't seem to like it there. Um, and we have um, at least twice yearly gatherings of the volunteers. There are uh, approximately a dozen of us. And, and we were trained and in the spring we do um, a weeding after the, the plants are up enough so you can identify them. We do a weeding um, and then once the plants uh, have started to grow enough, then we cut back the dead growth um, in the fall, we do, um, we also cut back some, but not uh, completely because you want to provide some cover during the winter months for birds. And um, also, again, to be able to identify things in the spring when they come up. So those two workshops are very useful uh, for the volunteers. Uh, as far as um, the education, as I said, we had that wonderful weed whacking experience and that showed us that we really did need to have education, which we had planned on all, all along, but it was a, really a, a huge effort to um, design the signs and we applied for a grant from Chesapeake Bay Trust, which we uh, were awarded, it was about $3,600 for the uh, fabrication and installation of the sign, plus also some money for additional plants. And we bought some tools that could be used uh, for the volunteers who maintain it or for other programs. And part of the grant, uh, besides uh, um, having the sign, was to incorporate the community. And so we designed a number of events uh, to introduce the community to the gardens and to have some workshops. We did a bunch of them. We had a master gardener come and talk about the Baywise gardens. Uh, we did one on uh, plants and setting up containers. And the one that's been most successful and we still are doing uh, every year in the late winter, February, or maybe early March is a pruning workshop. And we prune not the gardens, but some other green spaces in our community that, that the Streetscape Committee of the Association has been uh, integral in, in uh, 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 planting and, and getting done. And then we go out into the community and work on some of the trees, the younger street trees, which again is a big part of the Streetscape Committee in, in Baltimore. And so that's been very successful and very useful because the city does not have the resources or the manpower to trim trees. Um, did, did I answer all your questions? <laughs> and more some? <laughs> yeah, well, and there's, there's a lot there. And um, I noticed, and I don't know if we'll have time to get to this question, but both your um, gardens and um, the gardens at Homewood Friends um, have interpretive signage. Um, so there's, you know, really this um, very, you know, purposeful effort to uh, educate folks um, yeah. about, you know, the purpose of the garden and um, the plants there, which, which I think is so cool. Um, and so actually speaking of uh, education, that's kind of a good segue for me to ask Taylor next. Um, so you saw this space at Loyola. 
And Taylor, you mentioned in your video that students um, were um, part of the effort to plant all those plants. And so I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about how you, um, you know, how that day was organized um, with students to help with the planting and um, whether that space has continued to be used as um, an education space for students. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we planned um, the planting in early October and we essentially recruited courses, biology courses that had been involved in the planning process. So we recruited um, conservation biology students to actually design the space. And then we used the following semester students to help us plant those spaces. Since then, we've had hundreds of students come out into that garden. So it's a great education piece for us. It's sort of our sustainability real estate, as I like to say. Um, we do a lot of work with the students in terms of invasives because it's a sort of restored meadow habitat. We get a lot of English ivy and um, poison berry and all of these invasives that we definitely don't want crawling out of that forest space and into our meadow. So um, the students do, um, they do sort of invasive removal. And then we also have a vegetable garden space where they do some um, veggie garden planting and composting workshops and, and things like that. So it's a heavily used space on our campus and it's been a huge asset for us in terms of talking about the work that we're doing to try to introduce wildlife habitat sort of weaved throughout our campus. Nice, that's awesome. That's something that um, we see a lot of uh, elementary, not so many like universities um, yet applying for their um, Audubon sign, but several elementary school, middle schools, and um, the, it, well, it usually takes a really committed teacher, right? Um, mm -hmm. But then that space getting used by, by kids for learning is just like a, a great asset. And actually one of, um, one of the rain gardens in Butcher's Hill um, that Bet Betsy showed us is um, on the corner of a school. And I just imagine kids walking past it every day and getting to see cool stuff. So, um, so that's great. Um, thanks, Taylor. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask Gary next. And um, there you go. Thanks, Susie. <laughs> um, so Gary, you had mentioned several partners when you were um, telling us about the space there. And I was wondering if you could tell us more about the effort that went into making those partnerships and just kind of dreaming up the space together and the collaboration that had to happen there, the compromises that had to happen and um, how those partnerships helped you uh, to be able to seek some funding. Because I think that might be the number one question that people have is how do you sure. do this? Well, uh, Homewood Friends Meeting is uh, a member of uh, One Water Partnership that uh, the leading organizations are Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake, Blue Water, Baltimore, and Interfaith Power and Light. And we worked with um, Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake that organized workshops to, for funding through um, Chesapeake Bay Trust. So they really helped us uh, design our proposal and sort of guided us through the process. <clears throat> And then we received a $5,000 grant. I think that's sort of their mini grant. Uh, and we committed $3,000 to develop the cisterns that are in the garden, uh, sort of a matching fund. And we worked with Blue Water Baltimore last May to uh, plant the garden. Mary at uh, Herring Run uh, Nursery did the design work. And uh, Jesse Hillman was sort of our project manager from Blue Water Baltimore. And uh, that day in May, there were a lot of volunteers from our meeting and also from uh, One Water Partnership congregations. And, and I think, you know, we did a lot of background work with our meeting and uh, with, with Quakers, we decided as a community and the community was enthusiastic about it, enough so that uh, we, we developed a, a garden club and a number of, of our members of the congregation take care of the maintenance. Every couple of weeks we have weeding and uh, different work around the garden. In the spring, uh, we also have a budget 
as part of the meeting's budget for garden maintenance. And in the spring, we'll prune the garden and mulch the garden. And we sort of conferred with Mary and at Blue Water, I mean, at uh, Herring Run Nursery in terms of the sort of maintenance of the shrubs. Great. Um, yeah, and I see some uh, questions are still coming up in the chat. So I have one more question. I'm coming to you next, Pastor Michael. Um, but uh, we only have about five minutes left. So put your questions in there and then um, I'll ask Susie if she uh, is seeing any that we can ask um, our panelists before we wrap it up. So um, I wanted to ask, so I have to say, Pastor Michael, when I uh, watched your video for the first time and you said that you hope the garden makes God smile, I just got like the biggest smile on my face. <laughs> Um, and so I wanted to. Are you are you deifying yourself? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, don't even answer. I'm just messing. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to ask you how the garden and environmental stewardship in general um, has worked its way into your services or any of your other programming that you do there at the church. Yeah, yeah. Um, our church is like 30 years old. I came here three and a half years ago from. Southern California to help revitalize it. And everything about the church was insular and kind of inward um, directed, right? Uh, among themselves. And so um, uh, a flood, a flash flood two years ago, and this park and the forest and everything have kind of like, you know, almost supernaturally opened up our community, uh, our church community to the community. Um, and so it has helped transform. Uh, so we are so much more connected to the everyday life in our neighborhood. Uh, people are using the walking trails and the stream and, and the pond, they're not in it, but you know, the, the healing effect of all of that. And, um, and as I said earlier, we're we're just learning stuff. You know, we we know the kind of birds, and we got some crazy huge owl uh, in our forest that you know obviously has been there, but nobody paid any attention to it. So, uh, you know, the short answer is it is part of this has been it's been immensely transformational for us as a congregation, and for and especially even with our youth for kind of looking up and realizing that there's a lot of life around us, not just the life we talk about on Sunday morning services. Thank you. So Susie, and I realize now I've, I've taken up the whole time with my questions. I hope everybody enjoyed them. <laughs> but Susie, um, were there any other questions in the chat that we wanted to address? I've been watching the chat and I think they've been answered. Thank you to the participants who've been asking questions in the chat and to the panelists who've been answering. So I think we're caught up um, on, on all the major questions. Thanks everybody. Okay. Well then with that, yeah, yes. Okay. With that, you know, if anybody has any other questions for any of um, the panelists, um, or for us, um, of course, you can always email us at baltimore at audubon.org. We're, you know, not so reliably back in our office every day, so email is probably best at this point. Um, Aaron, there is one question, sorry, that just came in for Pastor Martin. Right. Okay, Pastor Michael. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think it's worth asking. Have other churches, or I might add congregations, come to see what you're doing? Um, because Pastor Michael and I were talking about how you're an example, right? With so many initiatives happening in the environmental realm. How is that going? Um, there have been a couple. There have been more that are kind of in the schedule, you know, based upon um, what's going on right now uh, to come and, and see what we're doing or how this is working out kind of a thing. So. Thank you. Okay, now, Erin, I think that is it <laughs> for questions. <laughs> well, look at that, it's yeah. 11 o'clock. La last week's tour went like 15, 20 minutes over. So we're <laughs> happy to be um, ending on time and just really appreciate 
again, all of our, uh, our community representatives, uh, gardeners, leaders, uh, for being with us and um, sharing all of your expertise. And um, thanks everybody who was here participating today. Thank you so much. And um, with that, have, have a great day. Hope everybody's staying safe. Hope we get to see you again really soon. Thank you all. Bye, this thank is you. great. Bless you. <laughs>